All right, this is podcast 2.3 for AP Chemistry, and we're going to talk about acids and bases and do a couple simple calculations with them. All right, the first thing we're going to talk about are definitions of what an acid and a base is. Arrhenius said that an acid is anything that produces H plus in solution, and he said that a base is anything that produces OH minus in solution. So you just need to have those definitions down. The other one is the Bronsted-Lowry definition of an acid and a base. They said that an acid is a proton donor and a base is a proton acceptor. Um, if you remember, protons are just hydrogen ions because that would only have a single proton in it. So when we say it's a proton donor, we mean it's an H plus donor. This is an H plus acceptor. And then for a strong acid and base reaction, such as HCl and NaOH, you remember those from your strong acids and strong bases lists, we know that the net ionic equation for any strong acid and base always comes up to be this. You get a proton and a hydroxide ion coming together to give you water. No matter what acid or base you put together, if it, they're, they're both strong, this is what you're going to get. So... Um, that's a really important fact to remember as we go throughout these next few slides. Okay, we're going to talk about titrations, and we'll do more with this later on, but we're just going to kind of do a quick overview. Titrations, you need to know some vocab words. We have a titrant, and the titrant is what we know the concentration of. It's what we're going to put in the burette, and we're going to use to find the concentration of some other thing. The analyte is what we're analyzing. It's what we don't know the concentration of. And then we use the titrant to figure out the concentration of it. The equivalence point in a titration is when we've added just enough of our titrant to react with all of the analyte. So it's exactly mole-to-mole -mole ratio equivalent. We're talking stoichiometry. That doesn't always occur in titrations. We usually either um, go over the endpoint or just under the endpoint. And the reason we do that is because we have to use indicators. And an indicator is something that changes colors. And you're most familiar with phenothaline. Phenothaline goes from clear to pink. This is the endpoint. So it may be a little past the equivalence point, but it's our closest. It tells us that we are finished with the titration. We need to record volumes. Um, what we're doing is done. So the equivalence point is the stoichiometry equivalence point. The end point is where you actually stop because you see the indicator change color. All right, so here are some indicators, and this is what a titration setup would look like. There is a whole slew of different indicators that you can choose, and you can see the pH scale up the side here. Depending on where you want your... Um, solution to change color, depending on where the endpoint is, what the pH is at that endpoint, will help you choose which indicator you want. And when we're talking about strong acids and strong bases, when we put those things together, we end up with water. So a strong acid and a strong base, that gives us water. And we know water has a pH of 7. So when we do a strong acid and a strong base, we look for a pH of 7. We want something that does a color change right about there. And that is why we most often choose phenolphthalein, is because it's right around a 7 where it changes. You could also do phenol red. Um, these are a little harder to tell because sometimes you see it go yellow and then it looks a little orange and then it goes red. So the phenolphthalein is nice because it goes from clear to pink. It's really easy to tell when you've changed colors. So phenolphthalein, really common. Here's our setup. This is, remember, called the burette. And that's where you put your titrant. This is what we know the concentration of. We can add it, we turn this, we can adjust it by drops. This is your analyte down here. This is what we're analyzing. And we're looking for this to usually go pink if we're using the phenothaline. So I think we used these once last year, but you'll get to use them again. Um, when we're doing these titrations, if you were able to track the pH, you would see a curve that appears like this. And there's two types. This is the titration curve of a strong acid. So we're starting with a strong acid, 
the strong acid is in the beaker and then in the burette is where we put the base. So the pH is going to be really low to start with because we know acids have very low pHs. Then as we add the base, the pH starts to rise. And then it shoots up in this straight part on the graph. Halfway up on that straight point is the equivalence. That's the, mol that's the molar equivalence point. If we were to do stoichiometry, that is the equivalence point, and that's about where you would see the color change as well. So the equivalence point is always halfway up the straight part on the graph. And then this one is if you had a strong base down below and you were titrating with an acid. So we would start with a base which has a high pH, and as we add the acid, you would see the pH drop down. So two types of titration curves. This is what they look like. You'll be familiar with those later on. Okay, we're going to do three problems with acids and bases. Here's the first one. It says, what volume of a 0.1 molar hydrochloric acid solution is needed to neutralize 25 milliliters of 0.35 molar sodium hydroxide? Now, what we know is that with your strong acids and strong bases, they react in a 1 to 1 ratio. So for every mole of acid that I have, it reacts with one mole of hydroxide to produce water because remember this is the net ionic for all of these reactions that we're talking about. So one mole of the acid reacts with one mole of the strong base to give us water. That being said, this is a shortcut we can use for these calculations. Oop, that was a terrible box. This looks a lot like that dilution one, and we can use it because we know that the moles of the acid have to equal the moles of the base. So this would give us moles of the acid, moles of the base. They have to be equivalent, so we get to use this. Um, and all I do is just plug and chug. So I have 0.1 molar HCl. And then it's asking me for the volume of my acid. And that needs to neutralize this concentration of my base. And I have 25 milliliters of it. And it's okay to leave it in milliliters. I just need to be aware that my answer will come out in milliliters. So if I do this, take 0.35 times 25, and I divide by 0.1, the volume of your acid is going to be 87.5 milliliters of your 0.111 or 0 0.100 molar HCl. And that's as simple as that problem is. It doesn't get much more complicated than that. So, next one. Hydrochloric acid, that's how much we have of it, that's its concentration, is added to 225 milliliters of 0 0.055 molar barium hydroxide solution. What is the concentration of the excess hydrogen ions or hydroxide ions left in this solution? This is very much like a limiting reactant problem. They're saying I have this much of my acid, this much of my base. I'm going back to the idea of my net ionic that looks like this. So I know that my hydrochloric acid will provide the H+. Plus. And then my barium hydroxide is going to produce my OH minus. What I need to watch out for, though, is this barium hydroxide will produce two hydroxide ions every time it splits up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out how many moles of hydrogen ions come from this, how many moles of hydroxide ions come from this. We're going to start them by doing two of the calculations using the molarity formula. So beginning with the acid, we would have 0 0.250 molar, and that's equal to our number of moles over 0 0.075 liters. And if you do that, your answer will be 0 0.01875 moles of HCl. And then I care only about the H+, plus, and since there is one H in this whole thing, that number is also equal to the number of moles of hydrogen ions. 
Then I have to take my barium hydroxide. So I have 0 0.0550 molar of that equal to some number of moles divided by my 0.225 liters. So x in this one, the number of moles, is 0 0.012375 moles of barium hydroxide. And then I care only about the hydroxide ions, and there are two of these in here. So to figure out the ions, I would take this times two, and that's going to get me 0 0.02475 moles of OH minus. So all I have to do here is look which of these is the bigger number. Well I have definitely more of the hydroxide ions and they're going to react in a one-to-one -one ratio so all of my hydrogen ions are going to get used up which makes this my limiting reactant. And then in order to figure out how many moles of my hydroxide is left over I just have to do a subtraction problem. So I'm going to take 0 0.02475 and I'm going to subtract all of my moles of hydrogen ions. That's going to give me my leftover unreacted hydroxide ions. So when you do that subtraction, you get 0 0.006. And that's your leftovers. They didn't ask me for moles of my leftover hydroxide though, they asked me for concentration. So the last thing I need to do with this is divide it by the total moles of my new solution, or divide it by my total liters of my new solution. So if I look back up here, I had 75 milliliters of the acid, I had 225 milliliters, I guess I'll leave this, I need to leave this in liters, liters. 225 milliliters of my base and I just add those up to find the total volume. So if I take the 0 0.006 and I divide by 0.3 because those would add up to 300 milliliters I end up with 0 0.02 and it's looking like I need three significant figures. So I have to add two extra zeros on the end there. Molar, hydroxide ions, left over. So there's that problem. All right, last one. In our last example here, we have a student titrating. They're titrating an unknown amount of potassium hydrogen phthalate. Here's the formula for potassium hydrogen phthalate. Um, we call it KHP, and that's what we, we will refer to it in the lab. What they did was they had to use 20.46 milliliters of 0 0.10000, I said too many zeros, molar sodium hydroxide solution. KHP, here's its molar mass, so you don't have to go back and add this whole thing up, has one acidic hydrogen. That tells me that it reacts in a one-to-one -one ratio with NaOH. So one mole of KHP reacts with one mole of the NaOH. They're one-to-one. -one. And it wants to know what mass of KHP was titrated. So how much KHP, here's my Erlenmeyer flask, did we have in here? If it took 20.46 milliliters of 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide solution to reach the endpoint. So the first thing I need to do then is I need to figure out how many moles of NaOH was this because I know that it was a one-to-one -one mole ratio how they reacted. I'm going to use the molarity formula first. So 0 0.1000 molar equals my moles of sodium hydroxide over this many liters and when I do that I get X is equal to 0 0.002046 moles and since we know that it's a one-to-one -one mole ratio this must also be equal to my moles of KHP And then this just becomes a stoichiometry problem.
And it's just the one step where I say, well, I should write moles in, where I say that one mole of my KHP is equal to the grams that they gave me up here, the 204.22. Oops. And that's all you have to do. You take all that, that times that, plug it into the calculator, and your answer comes out with that amount of grams of KHP must have been in your flask to start with. So not super complicated problems. We're not really using anything new in terms of um, steps because we're still using the molarity formula and stoichiometry. We're just using this idea of acids and bases instead of ions splitting up and going into solution. And that is it.